you're like looking at your bullets saying, wait, Rich is like two songs early and a prayer we didn't get to. Hey, today we're, we're kind of turning things upside down because I got to get upstairs to preach also. So I'm preaching early in the service down here this morning, and then you'll go back into worship um, after that and have the rest of the worship and time. It's going to be great. It is so good to see people here. Um, you know, last night we had a real small crowd upstairs, a small crowd this morning. Thank you for being here this morning. I, I know it's hard, um, but as, as, as thankful as I am for y'all being here, uh, we have people here the whole way from New Jersey. They came just to worship with us. No, I'm lying. They are here from New Jersey, though. But um, I want to introduce you to a, to a personal moment, if I could. Mark and Diane McCaslin and their son Colin, just wave. This is Marsh's roommate from college, and their 15-year-old son, Colin, is this incredible ballet dancer. He is like professional level, and Pittsburgh is hosting the second largest youth ballet competition this weekend. So they're here in town for that. We got to see them, and we're glad to have you here. Welcome. How exciting. Hey, friends, we're going to jump right into it. Um, what you're about to hear is uh, a recording. And I'm going to tell you ahead of time, you're not going to understand but maybe two words in about 55 seconds. And that's okay. It's not really meant to be understood what they're saying. What's important are the voices who are saying it. So go ahead and take a listen to this. Open all right. Okay, so I know those voices mean nothing to you, but they mean the world to me. That was 1968 Christmas at my grandparents' house. And what you heard on there, it doesn't, I know it sounded like Minnie Mouse. That was my sister. She was four. I was two. That was my mom and my dad when they were young parents. It was my grandparents when they were still middle-aged parents. And the one voice, yeah, what you get it in? A boot. Got it in a boot. That was my great-grandpa who I knew for about five years of my life. And so while those, those voices maybe don't mean anything to you, man, they are a treasure to me. We found this old RCA tape recorder and a couple of tapes in my dad's storage bin when he passed, and they would have been thrown out. But I found this, and what's, what's really great about it is, of all the voices you heard on there, only two are still alive, my sister and me. And so that is a treasure to me. But um, more than a treasure for just voices on tape is it reminds me that I'm in a lineage here. I've come from a great-grandfather and, and a grandfather and a, and a mom and a dad. And more than just voices on a tape, they've left behind something for me that is way, way, way more valuable. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Listen, if you've not been with us through this sermon series, it's called The Family Project. And we've gone back, uh, like your memory verse, and we've, dis we've, we've discovered that family was, first of all, God's design. We talked about the fact that your family matters. We talked about your family language. We've talked about family decisions. And last weekend, we talked about family disasters. Like, you know, when, when God's design seems defunct, when, when all that other stuff just doesn't work and your family dynamics are more like family dynamite, right? We talked about that and, and what do you do when those situations arise. And if you missed any of those sermons and you want to um, maybe catch up or hear one of them again, uh, or maybe you know a family that needs to hear one or more of those, listen, just go to our website. Go to www.communityumchurch.com. Go across the top bar, click on resources, draw it down, and uh, click on uh, video sermons. And when you do that, you'll find all the sermons from upstairs and downstairs, uh, and they're all right there for you. But this week is our final sermon in, in this series. And today it's called Family Inheritance. Do you know what you inherit if you're in the family of God? If you're a child of God, and, and, and I, I say the word if, and a lot of people think, well, isn't, isn't everybody a child of God? Not according to God's word. See, the apostle John, who wrote the gospel of John, wrote it this way. He said, to those who received Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. 
Everybody's a creation of God, but not everybody's a child of God. That happens when you give your life to Jesus Christ. So when you give your life to Christ, you become a child then of our Heavenly Father. Do you know what you receive as your inheritance? Life. Eternal life. Life on this side of eternity, right here, right now, like you could never live it on your own, but also life on the other side of eternity with Christ forever. And that's your inheritance. And you get to receive that. It's a great privilege to receive that, right? Okay, let's pretend we're Baptist, okay? Um, so it's a great, great privilege to receive that, right? Yeah. Amen. But it's also a great responsibility to, to extend it to others. See, we, we get it, but we also are charged to give it back out. That's what we're talking about, family inheritance, where we are and you are to live your life to impact the generation around you, but also the generations that come after you. So we're going to talk about that for a little bit this morning uh, to teach you and to teach me how to live a life that extends beyond your own life, here and now, and then even after you're gone. So let's get ready for that. Let's, let's let God lead us on in. Let's pray. So Father God, thank you. Um, that you teach us about these things because we need to learn about these things. We believe this is important on your heart, God, so we want to give um, our attention to you and let you speak. I pray, Lord, that nobody's here to hear a man preach, but to hear the word of God exposed. So Jesus, as we walk into your word today, uh, pour it into us and give us ears to listen and minds to grasp and spirits to receive with joy what you would give us today. For Christ, we pray this in your holy name. And all of God's people said, Amen. So last week, I went through one of those markers of life that remind you and me that we're getting older, right? It's called a birthday. We all get those. Whether you want them or not, they come about once a year. And so I went through a birthday last week, and I'll tell you, I don't feel like I'm 49. I don't feel like I'm that old, uh, but I am. But la something happened last weekend, last Sunday morning actually, that reminded me that I am. And it happened upstairs in the 830 service. You know, 8.30 service, I usually get up and I do the announcements and help run the service. Then I sit down in the front pew on, on, on my right as I'm facing congregation. I sit like right there where Riley's sitting. And so I'm, I go to sit there, but the entire front pew was taken. It gets crowded up there at traditional service sometimes. And, and I know, crazy, the front pew in the United Methodist Church was taken. It was weird. But, but I go to sit there and it's all taken. So I had to go over to this side like where Dave's sitting. And I sat there right in front of the pulpit. I thought, great, I'm right in front of Pastor John. He's going to preach. He's really uncomfortable. You know, but I'm right there. And all was going great until we got to the children's sermon. Because you know what the children's sermon they do, right? They, they, you know, they, if you've never been up there, we have monitors all through the sanctuary, uh, and they put on screen, they live feed it onto the monitors, the children's sermons, you can see all the cute little kids. So they, they pan out of, of that uh, children's sermon to get them all, and sure enough, right there on every monitor in the entire room, right in the bottom right-hand corner was my bald spot. <laughs> because of where I was sitting, it was, you know, and they say a camera adds 10 pounds, it also takes away more hair. It's like, oh my gosh, I, I didn't think it was that big and bright and bold. And woo, there it was for everybody to see. And it was just, you know, wow, embarrassing. But more than embarrassing, it was awakening. And it made me start to think, you know, don't, don't I want to make sure, is, is, as I'm moving up there in years, don't I want to make sure that when I am gone, I've left something behind worth inheriting? Is a dad that makes my heart anxious. You know, is there a legacy I'm leaving? Is there something that I'm, I'm, I'm laying down that they can pick up and own for themselves that is really valuable for them? So, so it makes me um, begin to realize that I've got to start living a life that allows that to happen. You know, my dad had a saying. My dad had a saying, he was already divorced from my mom. He was married to a second wife. And they're kind of, you know, kind of in that newlywed phase. And they were um, just enjoying life, living life out there. And he would say, hey, Rich, guess what? I'm spending your inheritance. I looked at my dad, and I remember thinking, I don't understand you, because you're so fixed on worldly things. Dad, I don't care if you spend all the money. Big deal. Like, you want to leave a trust fund, I'll take it, you know. Uh, I won't turn it away. But the reality is, Dad, I, I, I wish I would have said this right to his face. Dad, you can spend all the money you want. I just wish you would have left me an inheritance of being a godly man. I wish you would have left a legacy for me to become a godly man become a godly husband, to become a godly dad, to become a godly grandfather, to become a godly neighbor and a godly friend. I wish you would have left that legacy. I don't care. Spend it all. I just wish you would have left a legacy that was more important. And it makes me now think about my kids. 
And I hope right now that you're thinking about your kids. Don't you want to leave them something that's worth inheriting? Don't you want to leave them something that's going to mean more than the things of this world that they can take and own for themselves? And listen, I, I don't care if your kids are in preschool or they are the principal of the school. It is never too early. It is never too late to begin to think about the legacy you're going to leave. In fact, um, God gave me a, a line yesterday. I wish I could have had time to put it in, into the pro presenter. It was already done. But um, li listen to this line God gave me. Live the legacy you want to leave. Live the legacy you want to. Don't wait until you're gone and hope it's there. Live it now so that your kids and, and, and your uh, people around you are catching it. Because this is more than about parents to kids. Right? We're talking about you impacting the generation around you and the generations that come after you with the message of Jesus Christ. And so, if, if, you're, if you're married, you've got to think about your spouse. What legacy are you leaving right now in the life of your spouse? If you're a parent, definitely your kids. Or talk, what about your nieces, your nephews, your neighbors, your co-workers, your classmates, your friends? You, you should be, we need to be living lives that leave a legacy right now to the generation around us. So how, how, how do you do that? How do you live an inheritance that's worth inheriting? How do you leave a godly legacy? Well, simple. You turn to one of those perfect families in Scripture, right? You're like, wait, wait, Rich, you've spent five weeks saying there's no perfect family in Scripture. You're right. Th listen. Even Jesus' family was messed up. Remember that they lost God for three days? Remember, left Jesus in Jerusalem, how embarrassing that was? Uh, can you imagine if they ran into the Father, God to Father? Hey, Mary and Joseph, by the way, how's Jesus doing? Um, he's doing great right now, Father. We're not sure where he is. We lost him for three days. You know, that would be a hard one to explain. But even Jesus' family was fractured. There are no perfect families in Scripture, which is really great because now I can relate to them. Like, God set the ideal... But my real is so far from the ideal. I'm glad God said, you know what? Here are the families that I'm going to show you. These are families that are not perfect all through my word. Um, there's not a single one that measure up to where I need them to be. All of a sudden, that makes, makes it possible for me to learn from them. You know, God showed us all their frailties, all their brokenness, all their weakness, all their worries, all their fears, all their failures. He just airs the dirty laundry of all these families in Scripture, which is great because now my family can relate to those families. So we're going to relate to one of those families today, and it's going to teach us about family inheritance. I'm going to start by telling you the story of one of my favorite characters. Um, his name is Joseph. And if you're raising kids, if, or if you're raising grandkids, or you've got people you kind of you're, you really want to leave a legacy for, this is a great target. I would love my kids to grow up to be like Joseph. And so we're going to talk about that story first, but then we're going to go back in time, about three generations, I'm going to show you why he ended up like he ended up. And that's what's going to be really relevant for those of us who are trying to leave a legacy right now. So let's talk about Joseph. Joseph was born like into the Judeo-Christian family of all families. His great-grandfather was named Abraham. And then if you want to have a great-grandpa like from Bible, that's a good one to have, right? Here's Abraham. This is who God called. This is who God said, I'm going to make a nation out of you. And the whole nation of Israel uh, started with this one man named Abraham. Abraham had a son so that uh, Joseph's um, granddaddy was named Isaac. Isaac had a son whose name was Jacob, and that was Joseph's dad. And uh, you can see that lineage there on screen. Uh, and Jacob, I'm going to tell you about Jacob real fast because this is kind of good stuff. Jacob was a twin. He was a younger by about a minute. His older brother's name was Esau. Thank you. Uh, so Jacob and Esau, and, and they weren't really on speaking terms. In fact, let me just kind of quote for you to get an idea of their relationship. Esau, the older brother, his, his words about his brother uh, Jacob went like this. I'm going to kill him, and I mean it. You know, they, they, yeah, they're not in great speaking terms. Um, and that tends to happen when younger brother Jacob stole his older brother's birthright and completely altered his life forever. So that kind of tends to happen. And so uh, Esau says, I'm going to kill my little brother. Literally, I'm going to take his life. Well, Jacob's not stupid. Jacob gets the heck out of Dodge, and he goes to visit Uncle Laban, his mom's brother. And he goes to stay with Uncle Laban says, I'm going to stay here with you kind of until it cools down at home, and I'll work for you. That's great. You're my, you're my nephew. You can work for me, but, but how am I going to pay you as a family member? And Jacob looked at uh, Laban's two daughters, Leah and Rachel. He said, Rachel, the younger one, whoo, she's, she's a pretty girl. I'll tell you what, uncle, I'll work for you for seven years in exchange for her in marriage. 
You give me your hand at the end of seven years. Laban said, done, go to work. Seven years, uh, Jacob works. Uh, Yay, hi, you get to marry Rachel. Uh, uh, but it didn't work that way. When it came time for the marriage, Laban substituted Leah, his older daughter, uh, and gave her to him instead. He said, this is not what we agreed on. And Laban said, well, where we come from, we marry the oldest daughter first. If you want to marry my younger daughter, you can work another seven years. So now he's got a, a, a wife he doesn't really love, but he still loves Rachel. He's going to work for another seven years, and he does. Now he has two wives. Can you just, ladies, you okay with this? Two wives and their sisters. Does that feel awkward to you? Ladies, hello? Yeah, okay. Yeah, all of a sudden, he's like, ooh, that's not going to be fun, right? And it wasn't because he loved Rachel, and he kind of, you know, made okay with, with Leah, but he loved Rachel, and Leah knew it. Uh, the challenge was Rachel couldn't have children. And so here's, here's Leah. She says, oh, this is my chance to make my husband love me more than my sister because I can have kids. And she pops out a son. She pops out another son, pops out another son. So she's giving them all these babies. There are some girls too, but they didn't really count back then, so we're just counting guys. She, she, you know, she, she gives them these sons. Like, Surely now my husband will love me more, but he still loved Rachel more. And Rachel's like, wow, you know what I'm going to do? I can't have kids. I have a maidservant. Hey, maidservant, come here. Maidservant, I'm going to give you to my husband. Uh, you'll be his wife, and he's going to have kids through you. They're going to be my kids, so I can raise a family lineage through you because you're my maidservant. So now, uh, Jacob's got not one wife, not two wives, but three wives. And wife number three comes in, and she bears a son. But older sister Leah, she's like, I can play that game. Hey, maidservant, come over here. I got one too. So she says, I'm going to give you as a wife to my, to my husband. And now he's got four wives. Three of them are having babies for him, but Rachel's still not having any babies. So, but you know, God hears her cry. God says, I'm going to let you conceive. And she conceives and gives birth to a baby boy whose name was Joseph. His name was Joseph. That's where Joseph came. That's how Joseph came into the world. So now here's Joseph and can just, just kind of picture the family dynamics. Hey, here are three wives I like, and you gave me 10 boys. That's great. But here's a wife I love, and oh, a brand new baby. Who do you think the favorite was? Right. When, when you were growing up, if you, had, if you had brothers and sisters, you ever wonder about that? Like, who's, who's the favorite of our parents, right? I know in this home's family, Vivian is. Sorry, Trent. Um, you know, but didn't you ever wonder? You kind of guess. Maybe I'm mom and dad's favorite. Maybe my sisters. I don't know. There was no guesswork in Joseph's family. There was no guesswork. Everybody knew favorite wife, favorite son, favorite child, period. And, and it wasn't a secret because dad even cemented that idea because he gave him a very special coat. Remember Joseph in the coat of many colors? Remember that? Don't you think Joseph wore that around as a gift from his dad? So how much I love you. Don't you think Joseph wore that around it to his brothers, you know, 10 older brothers? Oh, oh, you didn't get a coat? I did. Oh, your coat, that's worn and torn. Mine's brand new. Dad gave it to me. Where's your coat? Oh, you don't have one. Don't you know he wore that in front of his, mom, his, his brothers? And his brother's like, man, I'm going to wring his scrawny little neck. But that wasn't the worst of it. It did get worse. Uh, he had a dream one night. And he said, hey, brothers, I had a dream about y'all. Tell us your dream, little brother. Well, in my dream, I was standing there, and you all got on your knees, and you bowed down to me because I was your king and your ruler, and you paid me homage. You're like, you are so dead now. Literally. They're out there working in the field one day. He's now a 17-year-old uh, teenager. Uh, uh, Joseph is. He's with his 10 older brothers. And they said, let's kill him. We can't kill him. It'll break dad's heart. What are we going to do with him? Let's put him in a well till we can figure out what to do with him. They put him down in this well he can't get out of. And meanwhile, these Midianite tra tra uh, traders come by. Let's sell him to them because they'll take him to Egypt and make him a slave. Done. So now he's being led the whole way to Egypt where he sold into the house of a man named Potiphar. Remember Potiphar? I don't know if you ever heard this story or not, but Potiphar was the, um, uh, the chief of the guards. He was a, he was a captain uh, for Pharaoh, this number one military guy. And so uh, he's got to be a strict man. He's, he's a tough man. He gets the job done. And so Joseph is now his slave. But while Potiphar looked at Joseph, um, the Bible says that God was with Joseph. Through all that, God was with Joseph. And everything Joseph touched was golden. Everything he did was perfect. It was like really great. And Potiphar says, wow, there's something special about this Hebrew kid. I'm going to make him in charge of my entire, entire house. And he does. He's now the number one honcho for the entire household of Potiphar. Now, how many of y'all have teenagers? Would you ever put your teenager in charge of all of your accounts and all of your house and everything you own? I mean, this sounds crazy, right? 
I could do that with my kids because they're perfect. But I, <laughs> they're gloating. Um, but so now he's in charge. But, you know, the thing is, Potiphar was not the only one that noticed Joseph. You know who else noticed Joseph? Potiphar's wife. And the Bible describes Joseph as this young, strapping, good-looking, well-built young man. And she's like, ooh, you're looking pretty good. And she began to make advances on him. And one day he went into the house to do his work, and she corners him and she says, Joseph, I want you to be mine right now. He says, no way, Jose. I, I will not do that to my master, and I will certainly not dishonor my God. Did you hear that? God has never left Joseph. Joseph has never left God. Even after everything he's been through, he is still tight with God. So he flees. She grabs at him, grabs uh, the cloak he's wearing. He wrestles out of it. She's standing there holding a cloak, and she says, Guards, this Hebrew slave came in trying to take advantage of me. When I screamed, he ran, but I grabbed this, throw him in prison, and now he's in prison for something he didn't even do. He goes out of prison. The chief warden says, Well, you're a slave. Now it's worse. Now you're a slave in prison. But he, everything he touched went perfect in prison. You know, again, Scripture says God was with Joseph. And so he's, 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 he's put in charge of the whole prison. And while he's in prison, while he's in charge doing stuff down there, two of the kings or Pharaoh's officials were thrown in prison. They're on the, you know, short stay plan. Joseph's on the I'm never getting out of here plan. And one night these two officials, the, the, the baker and the cupbearer to the king, uh, they have these dreams. And they say, who can tell us what these dreams mean? And Joseph said, I can tell you what they mean. Hey, baker, in three days, you're going back before the Pharaoh. He's going to hang you, and you're going to die. But cupbearer, in three days, you go back to the Pharaoh. He's going to reinstate you, and you'll be a servant to him. And guess what? Those dreams came true, every bit of them. And so uh, Baker is hanged, and he dies. Cupbearer goes back to be the Pharaoh, and Joseph says, hey, by the way, when you go back to Pharaoh, tell him I'm here, and I didn't do what they said I did, and just take me out of prison. Let me be a slave again outside of prison. I'll remember you, son. I'll remember, I'll remember you because you, you told me you're right. He didn't remember him. Two years pass. So Joseph's still in, pray, in jail two more years, and, and Pharaoh has a dream. And Pharaoh says, I, this dream won't let me go. I, I can't get it out of my head. Someone's got to uh, translate it for me. All my wise men, come and tell me what it means. Nobody could tell him what it means. And the cupbearer goes, oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you. There's this guy in prison. Let's not go back there because it wasn't a good time for me, you just so you know that, Pharaoh. But there was a guy who told me about my dream. It was perfectly came true. Maybe he could do the same for you. Go get him. This is his chance, right? This is Joseph's big chance. This is Joseph standing before Pharaoh. He gets all cleaned up, gets all shaved up. He goes, he, you know, all you got to do is tell the Pharaoh his dream, right? And Pharaoh says, here's my dream. Can you tell me what it means? And guess what Joseph said? Nope. I cannot tell you what it means. Are you kidding? Stall. Make something up. This is your chance to get out of prison. I cannot tell you what it means, but my God can. God has never left Joseph. Joseph has never left God. And he interprets the dream. He says, here's what it means. Seven years, you're going to produce so much grain, you're going to have an abundance of food. The next seven years, it's going to be a famine. Your land and all the nations around you they're going to be hungry, and, they're, uh, and, and, and there's not, not going to be enough to eat for anybody. So, Pharaoh, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but if I were in your sandals, here's what I would do. I would build some barns, some storehouses. I would take a portion of the, of the abundance of grain. Every year, I would store it away and fill those babies up until that famine comes. You have enough food for everybody in your land. And then the people around you, the nations around you, they'll pay top dollar because you're the only game in town. That's what I would do. And Pharaoh says, you're in charge, get it done. And he just elevated Joseph to become the second most powerful man in Egypt. There's nobody more powerful. He's now more powerful than Potiphar and Potiphar's wife. He's now more powerful than the warden who kept him in prison. The only man he answers to is Pharaoh. And he did exactly what he said he would do. They collected all this grain, they put it in his storehouses, and nations came and they paid top dollar because it was the only food available. And guess who showed up? One day on Joseph's doorstep for food, his 10 older brothers. So they show up and they're hungry and they don't recognize him, but he recognizes them. And, he, you know, he plays them a little bit to begin with, but then he breaks down. Now, I'm, I'm just saying, if it was me, if it was me, when I saw my 10 older brothers who threw me in a well and, and then sold me to become a slave and kind of left me for dead, if it was me, I would have said, great. I got 10 new slaves to work in my house now, 
right? Because I had the power to do that. But that's not what Joseph did. Joseph never lost his heart of God. He looks at them and he, he plays them, but then he breaks down and he cries. He says, don't you recognize me? It's me. It's your little brother Joseph. And I remember what you did to me, but I forgive you and I love you. Let me, just, let me hug you and kiss you. And he forgives them. But then he goes a step further. He says, hey, go get dad. And go get dad's family. Go get your families and everything you own. And y'all move here because I'm the, most, I'm the second most powerful man in the land. I will give you the best part of the land and you'll never grow hungry again. We can start a whole new life back together as family. And that's what they did. And that's how the Israelites got into Egypt. Remember about 500 years later, 450, 500 years later, they were then, uh, by that time, they were now slaves. Things changed. They got be, became slaves in Egypt and Moses came to rescue them. But 400, 500 years before that, that's how they got into Egypt in the first place. That's the story of Joseph. Don't know if you heard it before, but in a very long nutshell, uh, there, there it is. So, so Joseph has done all that. And I look at the story of Joseph, and I look at the, uh, what, what all that he's do, done, and, and I think, man, I want my kids to be like Joseph. I want my kids to grow up with no matter what challenges they face, what temptations they face, whatever is, is hard that comes their way, I want them to be able to say, my God has never left me and I've never left my God through every single bit of it. I've remained faithful to him and he has so blessed me. I want my kids to end up like that. But I know it's not going to just happen. I know I have a role to play. Uh, so what I want to do is go back now, um, three generations because now you know where Joseph ended up, and I want you to be able to see why he ended up there. Let's put the screen back up, that one, um, with, with the, uh, the lineage. So his, his, his daddy uh, was named Jacob, his granddad was Isaac, and his great-great-granddad was named Abraham. And that's, that's where it all started. See, Abraham is defined as a friend of God, and Abraham uh, had this really unique and, and, and special relationship with God uh, because Abraham made a choice. Abraham made a decision that he would not walk away from God. He wasn't perfect, but he stayed faithful to God. Uh, and, and, and God honored that. And I want you to hear what God said about Abraham. This is, this is where it gets relevant for you and me today. If you've got your Bibles, that was pathetic. If you've got your Bibles, way to go. It's exciting to have your Bible. Genesis chapter 18, verses 17 through 19. Listen to this. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. Do you see the expanse of that? That's huge. All the nations on earth will be impacted by this man's life. Well, how in the world is it going to impact nations? He doesn't have time to run around to all these nations and impact lives. Here, here's how, verse 19. For I've chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Abraham made a decision to be all in for God, to, to walk in a way that was pleasing to God. And he made a decision then, uh, not just to be God's follower and to receive what God gave him, but to hand it off to his kids. They would hand it off to their kids. They would hand it off to their kids. And through that, they were able to impact nations we're here today because of what happened back in Genesis 18. Wow, that's legacy. That's inheritance. That's lineage. That's amazing to me. Because of a decision that great-grandpa made, Joseph kept the faith and ended up where he was. It just makes me think, what am, what am I laying down that my kids are picking up? What legacy am I leaving for my girls and my boy? You know, I, I, I hope to leave y'all some property. I hope to leave y'all a trust fund. I hope, to, I, hope, I, I hope to pay for your weddings. You know, yeah, I do hope to pay for your weddings. Um, boys have got to get through daddy first. Uh, I, I, I hope, I hope to, to um, put you through school. I want to do all those things for you. But the reality is, even if you do all those things for your kids, if you don't teach them about Jesus, you've left them nothing. I talked to a lot of people, you know, I ask, how, how, what are you leaving for your kids? What kind of legacy? Well, I bring my kids to church. I know a lot of kids who were brought to church, have grown up, and have won't set foot near a church. You know why? Because all they were, they, although they were introduced to church, they were ne never introduced to Jesus Christ. Sometimes we get into pattern 
of falling in love more with the church than we do with Christ, and that is so backwards. The church is a conduit to bring people to Christ, but it should never be substituted for Christ. Okay? Again, you can bring your kids to church. You can bring your nieces and nephews. You can bring your neighbors, your friends, your, your co-workers and classmates. But if you don't introduce them to Jesus Christ, then you've not given them anything. So this morning, let me just ask you this in, in, in closing down. What is it that you're leaving behind? What's your family inheritance going to be? What's your legacy? I'm not talking about anyone else's, but yours. What's your legacy going to be to the generation around you and the generations that are coming after you? Maybe this morning is a great time for you to get with God and say, God, I don't know. I think I'm doing it right, but I'm not sure. Can you lead me some more in this? God's not going to shy away from that. Maybe today is a great day to say, you know what, God, I've, I've not been doing it. I've been bringing them to church, but man, we don't pray together as a family. We, we, I don't talk about Jesus to my kids at all. We never read the Bible. We don't spend time and quality time in things of the faith. Um, I'm teaching them basketball. Um, I'm teaching them how to, how to uh, I'm supporting them in dance. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. But listen, I'm not teaching them about you, Jesus. And I, want to, I want to be better as a mom, better as a dad, better as an uncle, better as a friend, whoever it is, better as a neighbor. Maybe today. You need to get back on your knees before God and say, God, just lead me in this. I want it better than I am right now. So I'm going to leave you with that. The team's going to come up, and they're going to lead you in some prayer, praise and worship, and it's a great time for you to be thinking about the stuff you just heard from God's Word. Let this worship time help some of that to sink in. But let me pray us out of sermon and back into praise. Jesus, thank you uh, for who you are and what you've done and what you're doing and the way you're challenging us. Jesus, you are not content letting us be a people that... Um, it's not thinking about leaving a legacy. You challenge us in this. You said of Abraham, I know his heart. He's going to leave a legacy for generations and generations. And God, we want the same thing to be said about us by you. So Lord, search our hearts, try us, and challenge us. And if it takes, if it takes another level, then change us to become who you want us to become, to leave a godly legacy to the generation around us, and the generations that will come after us. For Jesus, we pray this, trusting in your holy name. Amen. All right. Hey, team, take it away, and y'all be blessed, and forgive me for running out.